So this is what leads to the biggest tax. So it's crucial for us, given that this is not a stochastic event, a, a hack is not a stochastic, yeah. it's not like car accidents. It's very targeted. The hackers are going to go for the weakest link and hack that, right? So we need to always constantly monitor to see if anyone is deploying updates. If they're deploying updates, we need to see, are they vulnerable? And if they're vulnerable, we're basically discontinuing their policy. Thank you very much. We have another panel here that goes a little bit uh, more in the insurance direction here about the exploration of decentralized insurance models. We have four experts here, Jan, Luca, Emmanuel, Sebastian, Nicolo, and one is actually remotely here. Hey, how are you? Please come on stage and give them a round of applause. And maybe start with you sharing like, what is the one thing the audience needs to know about you and your company? Well, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm Gianluca Berinzi and I'm the head of the Innovation Lab of Reality. The main information that uh, you could know about is the group of Reale Lupa. And my role in the group is that uh, Reale Lupa is about 200 years old company. And when I started managing the innovation within this group, uh, the very first thing that everybody that I knew was asking you was what making innovation within the insurance buildings already true. The truth is that from my point of view, we are a mutual company. We have kind of an attitude that is to grant our capability to be on the market and be in the business for years. And we change it so much, these two sectors. Yeah. So actually, we have to be able to innovate very much. Maybe a very changing thing is the rate, the speed of changes that we are all facing nowadays. So you need to add to the attitude also some competencies and capabilities to let you manage this uh, pace of changing that we all need to face and challenge in CEOs. All right, thank you very much for that. Emmanuel, what is the one thing the audience needs to know about you and generally? It's a similar story. We have 191 years of history. I think you always survive for those that will be your fun if you keep women in yourself. So the one thing is that there's probably much more than meets the eyes when it comes to innovation for e-commerce and particularly for Tingali. There's a lot of hidden gems and information happening everywhere, every day, and there's much more than meets the eyes. Sebastian, how about you? What is the one thing the audience needs to know about you and Shameproof? It's a uh, regulated primary insurance carrier for web famous. So similar as to the uh, previous fireside chat where you know we mentioned that they are throwing these kind of cyber risks for smart contracts. That exactly that's exactly what we're doing. And we have a license from the Bermuda Monetary Authority. We are reinsured by Munich Re and our biggest capital provider is Sampo, which is Japan's second largest insurance. Thank you very much for that. So a dream come true from the last panel. Are you a little bit? Thank you very much for that. And Nicolo, as part of Plug and Play Tech Center, you have like an overview a little bit about the industry. Right. And what is the one thing people need to know to you and the Plug and Play Center? Yeah, sure. So Plug and Play is a little bit different in the sense that we're not an insurance company. We're a matter of venture capital and we engage in open innovation with over 650 corporates worldwide in more than 21 industries. 2021, something like that. I keep losing track of the number, but let's say I'm primarily working as an investor on the insurtech side. And Emanuele, you talked about hidden gems. So let's say that our job is primarily that of looking for those hidden gems, scouting the world literally. And in this case, it's specifically good with insurance and with uh, attached as well on uh, Web3 and blockchain. Hidden gems in the insurance industry are also a new risk because new risks are new products and new money. And that's something we really know something about independently if they've been around a few years or a few hundred years, but who's counting? Sebastian, what kind of new risks do you see arise and especially new products? So last year when we received our license, we received it for this particular very niche risk of ensuring cybersecurity web free. Basically, like the previous candidates were mentioning, there are these smart contracts. They are basically programs and plugs. 
And if these bots are excluded on chain, they lead to the writer financial loss. Differ from Web2, where there's maybe a data breach. We're ensuring this risk in particular. And in addition to that, as Maka was saying on the previous panel, there's new risks. For instance, if you've heard of proof of stake chains, which are more energy effective than proof of work chains, we have this notion of slashing risk. So basically, people who are staking their tokens in order to earn income from participating in the security of the network are at risk of getting their deposit slashed if the node operator does a misconfiguration of the infrastructure. So this is something that we've also started ensuring, and it's picking up really fast because there is more and more participation on these kind of proof of stake chains, which are more eco-friendly. Thank you. Um, uh, well, we talked about novel risks, new risks. How the hell are we going to translate in that into products? And uh, can you share some insights into generally without getting a call from your boss? I, I was hoping to have you asked that one. That's the tricky one. It's very difficult, right? So for nature in general, new things, you know, that historical data, hence, it's very difficult to price that, right? The actuary are actually in the end, they want to know what is my risk, probability, impact, and maximum growth, that kind of things. And if you're approaching new space, that's a big problem to solve. Now, when it comes to the blockchain, as we learned earlier, right? It's been in the making for quite some time, so we start having some data. First of all, blockchain is public, so the intuition says, yeah, you can look at some of that data which are publicly available because of you know, the public ledger. And also with the new technologies, again, this is an intuition, you have a whole craze of synthetic data. Can AI help you create data and use those? I don't know if it's true or not, but certainly something to, to keep an eye on. So first, you need to start with the data. Some you have available, some might come. And then it's all about the innovation one-to-one. -one. It's all about building small experiments, taking small risks. You can do it in house, and you can spin off a piece of your business to take that controlled risks, or you can leverage on external companies. We do work a lot with startups. It's a cheap way to outsource your resources and your product. Thank you for that. Another question, we now talked about novel risk and direction, how to do it internally, external, build up capabilities or not. Let's dig a little bit deeper into the topic about what are we actually ensuring. We have new risks, but this risk changes also. For example, when you ensure a digital asset, we had, I think, in the first fireside chat about and the value is super volatile or and how do we deal with this and especially when we're in the cyber uh, cyber way how do we adapt with the constant changing technology and actually the changing risk profile Sebastian, uncharted waters is it insurable actually yes this is actually the biggest question that we've been trying to answer since 2017 when the mother company of trade proof got founded we, that, that is called Quantstamp, and it's a world-leading security service provider for yeah. Web3. And basically, we were going to many insurance events and trying to educate insurance, traditional insurance companies about this. The biggest problem is that there are not sufficient hacks or incidents in order to build, to go back and build a statistical model which mm. is relevant. So the approach that we've taken is to build a model using our security expertise. And in addition to having a st static model, we're basically continuously auditing and monitoring these systems after they are deployed, right? So this is exactly what you just mentioned mm -hmm. with this changing risk. This is very real because the big, one of the biggest causes of hacks are the, is the fact that there are contract updates. Yeah. So developers, of course, want to push new features. And sometimes these features are pushed too fast without having been checked by the proper security experts or even properly tested. So this is what leads to the biggest tax. So it's crucial for us, given that this is not a stochastic event, the uh, hack is not a stochastic, yeah. it's not like car accidents. It's very targeted. The hackers are going to go for the weakest link and hack that, right? So we need to always constantly monitor to see if anyone is deploying updates if they're deploying updates, we need to see, are they vulnerable? And if they're vulnerable, we're basically discontinuing their policy. Super interesting, because that would have been my next question. How do you deal with the situation when you come to the conclusion the risk is too high or not covered? Nicole, when we see at the 
novel risk, the answering and the complex, not only technological systems we need actually to address and monitor that, but also intellectually to have the in-house competence. Do you think it's unshattered, shattered waters or do you think the insurance industry is able to tackle that? Thanks for an extent, but to an extent, the insurance industry is also able to tackle that. So I remember specifically a conversation which I had with an insurer. And the question from the insurer was, how do we insure the metaverse? Which I laughed. And I responded, insuring the metaverse is like insuring the entire world, right? So you need to break it down to pieces. And it's, that is what you're doing with Web3, is what you're doing with blockchain, is what you're doing with all the different risks that come out. So for example, I've been studying roughly blockchain and its application insurance since 2016, where the first applications were in health. And then you had new applications not outside of insurance with supply chain and so on and so forth. But if you take it from insurance, you can do exactly that. You can break it down into smaller pieces and you know that the insurance company can tackle each piece. For me, it's usually five. It's hacks, it's authenticity, it's exploits, it's DAO's liability, and it's auditing. It's probably the biggest portion which then relates back to the initial component of hacking. So technically speaking, each insurer does either have the capability or can acquire the capability externally. It's just a matter of really sitting down trying to understand what is the risk that you're trying to tackle and do I have that capability in-house or can, where can I get that capability externally? But at the end of the day, we, it's, it's easy, not say easily doable, but it's, it's doable. We talk now about novel risks, about how we as insurers can react, what kind of risks there are, how to build systems that actually can monitor that. One thing we did not talk about is the customer and can share a funny story about Munich. How many Germans are in here? No, okay, no, no, that's all. I might survive this. So there was a prime minister of Bavaria who had a pet project. It was a magnetic train and it was a technology that has been around in Germany, I think for 40 years. It's a technology that actually did never, until a certain pound f a point, found the use. And everybody was like, oh my, it's so beautiful, it's so great. And there were panels on it and conferences. And actually nobody used this magnetic train replacement uh, until, the, uh, until it was done in China. And my question a little bit is, since we did not talk about the customers yet, like the end consumer, what will it take that these, or how can we drag customers into all of this? Or is it the wrong question? Maybe we go with Gianluca. So my question is customers, new customers, customer interaction. How are we going to excite the customer for this new world? Well, that's quite a, a tricky question again, excite a customer about this new world or it's our duty to help customer in managing the risk of joining this new world that are joining by themselves. I guess this is the second point is the right one. And uh, again, I think that we need to go back to the basics of the mission of insurers. Insurers help people to be back, to afford all the events that someone can face in his life. And again, I'm, I'm really sure that in the next 10 years, we have to be able to challenge our business models our final needs. It won't be just adapting to a new reality, the old offering. We need to change completely and too much changing about the availability of data, capability of calculating the risk, and then this will change the way we need the our services to the customer. From my point of view, the very relevant point is to be able to Stay on top, follow the changing of behavior, follow and accompany more than following the changing of attitude with the digital world of the people and then fulfilling their real needs. I am very concerned about the coherent development of regulation together with the development of this new technology. Digital increase, right now we are always thinking about something that is a digital asset, that is a copy of the real world. But from my personal point of view, digital twins will be a real copy of ourselves. We are all jumping in the interaction with AI, but can you imagine how much prompting in the open AI chat GPT 
is now to try to get our behavior, our attitude, uh, and together with the IMT, the yeah. NLT, that they are tracking us. In 10 years, we will probably be kind of cockets on the digital world, which can be the regulation to manage this digital asset of myself and how can we as insurer accompany the risk of having a copy of ourselves in the digital world. These are much the kind of questions that I am following up because the other one is more, let me say, and I know that I'm not very nice in this, but the other is much more world of business development, acquiring yeah. subject matter experts, not innovators. Innovators should try to afford the change in radical change, the corruption of the business world. I think that the issue of digital copies of ourselves, involuntary digital copies, if you want to name it, is something we as insurance industry cannot address ourselves. But you mentioned something interesting. I think let's talk about distribution. So imagine Metaverse is the next new thing. And so are the, will we be able to serve customers in the Web3 and the Metaverse? And when is, going to, when is generally going to open, I don't know, 10,000 Metaverse agencies? Not many times soon. I'm very skeptical about that. Okay. So you only do something is if it's X times better than the character of Danny, right? So a digital agency in the metaverse, is that really a thing? Would you use it? Would my daughter use it? Uh, yeah, I'm a bit very skeptical on, on, on that. There are all the areas where you can use immersive technologies we discussed about, you know, digital twins, that's really good for not so much underwriting, but risk prevention. There are things you can do with the immersive technologies, more on that front. The other problem is also technology right now is not ready yet. Even if you want it to, the master is clunky, it gives you a headache, given the new one yeah. from Apple, there's some uh, after half an hour. No one has tried it for more than half an hour. That probably means that it still gives you a headache after a while. So a bit skeptical, but as the technology evolves, if, you, if it gets lighter, if you can really create a sense of presence, possibly, but I think we are talking five, ten years. I love that you said you're not a big fan yet and that mm -hmm. something needs to be at least ten times better digitally, metaverse, internet anyway, so people start to change their customer behavior. My most favorite statistic is a net, no, a Blockbuster did the video chain, the video landing chain that did a survey. And the number one reason people liked Blockbuster was because I meet actually my neighbors in the store. But somebody else said, you know, what I love is sitting naked on the couch and <laughs> choosing my videos there. So that wasn't the question, the question in the questionnaire. What I want to say was that I think that's a 10 times better answer, Netflix rocket versus Blockbuster. Kolo, do you see distribution happening soon in the metaverse? No. Nice. Where are they? You don't know. No, no. <laughs> No, I don't see distribution happening anytime soon in the metaverse, primarily because I'm trying to understand what are the current channels, right? The yeah. most active channel. You really want to go in the metaverse, you really want to experience it in some form of way. And you put on a VR headset and you try to enter the central and, for example, on a VR headset. But then you need to look at the statistics which are behind a project like the center, right? And probably I think on a daily basis, there is 30 active users around the world with peaks that happen when certain companies try a stunt and make a specific event and they actively bring people. So I think a concept is extremely cool. It's extremely cool, especially from an advertising perspective. So if you are able to create some sort of entertainment which brings people, so for example, gaming, and we think of projects like Sandbox and so on and so forth. But if you are able to create some sort of entertainment that brings people into the platform because they have that dose of dopamine, that yeah. the thing that keeps them hooked, and then you use this space, the virtual space, mm. as almost like digital real estate for advertisements. That's where insurance companies potentially right now can benefit a lot because you, the guy's playing the game and on the side you have a digital building and there's generality written on it or there's AXA written on it and so on and so forth. That's super cool. So, so these guys are going after our ad budgets then? Potentially, but I, okay. think, I think that's one method of distribution. Now, do you want to translate the business, which is still very traditional, which is like agencies, brokers, and so on and so forth, and bring it into the metaverse? Potentially, but it will take a while. So that's there are some, okay. there are some please, please go. right? No. So someone in Europe, without naming names, tried, but numbers are 
down you talk about hundreds of interactions, so it's not there yet. I think also you need to remember that the insurance is an emotional business, right? You want to be there, something that happens, you want to help people, families with protection, right? So I think right now the investment technology is just something that gets you into the way of those emotions. Until you solve that problem, you're not selling insurance in the metaverse. That's my personal take. Sebastian, we're seeing a little bit of skepticism here. He, I asked him how insurance can make money and he told me how to spend it. So that's very good. How can insurers make money in the metaverse? I think your previous question, it really depends how you define metaverse, really. I think like there's a very strong bias here about defining metaverse in terms of virtual reality. I don't define it like that. So, like, I see anything on the internet and the app as the metaverse. So I think, like, if you're selling insurance online, you have an agency in the metaverse. You don't need 10,000 of them, you just need one because everyone can access it. So we don't need to open it in virtual reality. Anything that gets the job done really fast is fine. I think what Nicole said here about gaming, that has a lot of, makes a lot of sense with virtual reality. And, using the real estate there as advertising, that's great, but it doesn't make sense to open an agency and have people come here and buy insurance like they need to in the real world. Is there any way not doing that? There's tiny phone learning. So why do that in a virtual world? So I think like it really depends on the definition of metaverse really. And by all means, I also assume the definition of metaverse, or at least how most people intend it in that way, but I agree with you. Like the finite person is just a more immersive experience of digital reality. So any website is a little bit more immersive than the traditional web page. To me, that could potentially be addressed as the metaverse, but it doesn't necessarily have to be you in a headset, virtual reality, and trying to experience the world in a different way. Yeah. My, my next question is to the audience. If you uh, are super interested in the topic, please do, do, submit your questions into the app and don't hesitate. We'll have also a Q&A session at the end. As please don't hesitate to use the app there. If you look into, into the future, and I'm all going to ask the oldest company here first, which I think is Gianluca. When we look into the future over the next five years, there will probably be some interaction between Web3, Metaverse, and the insurance industry. But what do you think people interested in the topic should to drive this topic in their companies? I guess that in the next five years, so we won't face some dramatic changes. There will be a growing adoption, but a strong evolution of the interface the hardware access in this digital world. It, it doesn't matter if it's there for reality, augmented reality, or a little way, or whatever it is, but there will be a, a, a spreading around of the adoption of this from my point of view. And uh, I don't think that actually we will see anything disrupting our industry in the next five years. Probably in the next uh, 10 years, uh, something will rise. But I don't think this rush of changing the things dramatically. I see the opportunity of moving on. Distribution, for sure. The question you were asking the other fellow panelists before. Yes, distribution, it's a great marketing opportunity. Right now, the hype, the metaverse, it's a possibility to position as an innovative uh, insurance company. It's true that uh, you can have just one, but you need to follow the adoption and the changing uh, of the behavior of the people over there. And there is not a future yet uh, to forecast what it will be in 10 years. In five years, uh, I don't see anything else so disrupting. Nicolo, you have this market overview, of course, all we have, but you're the main job. Do you see that coming to the insurance industry? Do you, or what, or let me put it, rephrase it. What do you think insurers should do? Or do you have some tips, some hacks, what we can do to build up capabilities in our organizations to be able to answer that calling. Yeah, I think it goes back to what I was saying before. So you need to break down the problem and you need to understand how to position yourself. Then like, again, will we open agencies in the metaverse tomorrow? Probably not, in like a few years maybe. But when that time comes, the question is, will you have the capabilities which are needed to grab the change and actually embrace it? So if the question is no, you should probably gear up to understand what are the capabilities that you need and how do you build those capabilities internally so that when the time comes, that's 
you are actually ready. And I think the problem associated with this is also a problem of data in majority of cases. So I could see blockchain, Web3, Metaverse, and all of this like flooding the insurance space. The moment in which there's data that tells us that money is coming into this specific market, there's a concrete way in which insurer can reap the benefits off of this, and the market is ready for it.